So first of all, welcome, new venue for WX. So um, thank you for everyone for turning up and finding it. Uh, I was a bit worried that the location was going to be a bit inaccessible. But I think that's a off Kerr Street that worked pretty well. Um, so tonight, smaller venue, and there's a reason for that. We're going to do a few more rapid talks over the next few weeks. So keep a look on our Twitter stream, look on the meetup group. There's going to be one potentially a surprise within two weeks' time, around the one, two weeks after that. We're going to have it more rapidly because there's just a lot of speakers we have who want to communicate their, their passion for UX. So tonight we've got two speakers, and it's called Design Talks. Uh, I think it's a nice theme. We've had a lot of talks over the last few weeks and months about research and service design. And tonight it was nice just to bring this back to its core, back into design. So secondly, we're going to have a, a talk about uh, a new design language called Use the X, and it's a wonderful new product that enables designers to produce interfaces um, rapidly prototype and also output something that can be applied natively on the web or native to devices. And it's a brand new language. It's it's, it's going to be an impressive presentation. Um, more on that later on. That's the second one. But first, I want to introduce uh, Abby Smalley. Abby is a UX director from Optum. Now, my affiliation, I do work for Optum as well. <laughs> Um, and this really worked out very well time-wise. Abby is currently over working with me here in Dublin and also in England for the next month. So I, I just really couldn't pass up the opportunity of having Abby here without having her speak to you today. So I just want to thank Abby Noble for coming over for a month to help us out, uh, and secondly for taking the time out. So Abby is based in Minnesota, where she is a UX director with Optum. Um, I'm going to hand it over to her to introduce herself and take us through design workshops. So, Abby. Hey guys, uh, it's my pleasure to be here today, and thanks to the to the community here and Patrick for inviting me out. Um, I'm a pretty loud American, so I'm thinking you guys can hear me in back, but definitely wave if it gets a little hard to hear. So a little bit about myself, uh, Patrick noted where I work today. I've been in the UX field for about 13 years now, um, starting with a graphic design degree and then moving very quickly into interaction design, UX specifically, e-commerce. Um, I spent some time at 3M helping them develop their mobile strategy and user experience is just absolutely my passion. I love the psychology and art getting mixed together and helping users at its core. So that's something I'm really passionate about. And um, I don't know if you know much about uh, the team that exists within Optum that's actually in Dublin here. It's called UXDS, so it's a group that's forming. And so I'm part of that uh, American chapter. And it's kind of a neat group that has really a four-pronged approach of a front to back end solution. So they do design, research, accessibility, development. So we're really running the gamut to develop solutions and technologies for Optum as well as United Healthcare. So that's a little bit about where I work today. And this is very much why I love UX design workshops, thinking about focusing on that design aspect, because this kind of embodies how every one of my projects ends up starting, where you have a lot of either clients or stakeholders. Some people have good ideas about where they want to start. Uh, some people don't know anything about the product. Some are convinced they know everything that their users need. Some are very focused on one specific piece. And so I used to start by thinking that a design studio workshop was good for a group that didn't necessarily know their direction, which it absolutely is. But the more we use this tactic in our design thinking and starting off, it really is that sprint zero. Um, I realized that a lot of our groups, whether they're starting from nothing or doing a redesign or adding a component, really get value out of this. So today I'm really excited to share this piece with you, something that's been valuable to me and then give you guys pieces that you can go ahead and do this within your own organizations and then you know, shift it in a way that makes sense for you. So a workshop can help if your stakeholders don't seem to know what they want, if there's a lot of stakeholders. Um, like once you get to a point where you're getting you know, 20, 25 stakeholders, that's a lot of voices. You want to make sure that they all get heard and look heard well. Um, I feel like those initial conversations, if you have, if they feel messy, you know, this could very well be a good design workshop. As I said, it's a great kickoff just to get everybody on the same page as well. All right, so assumptions to avoid when you begin a project. And this project could mean uh, app. 
um, a website, a product solution you're creating, this can really apply for a, a really large gamut of those pieces. But assumptions I, I try to avoid is that everyone is on the same page. Uh, absolutely, this doesn't seem to be the case, even if they think they're on the same page. Um, once you get people sketching together and drawing out what they think that they're getting, you realize that there's definitely a lot of differences there. Um, everyone knows what the goal is. You know, everyone's in a different part of the organization. Might be, you know, some local, some, you know, far away somewhere else. So just making sure everyone's on the same page there. That everyone agrees on what the goal is. You know, how do we be successful in a design and UX field if our clients or who we're working with don't even know what their goal is? So just making sure that we're all on the same page with that piece. Um, that we all agree on what functionality is needed. And that everyone at the kickoff meeting is everyone that needs to be involved. Great question always asked, like who are the approvers here? Who needs to see this? Making sure you get that upfront. So never assume when you get in a room with five people that that's everybody that needs to be an approver because you can very much get to the end of your cycle, end of the design and find out, oh, has Bob seen this design? And Bob was never there, but you didn't know. So it's always good just to ask these questions up front. So the purpose of a design studio session, uh, collaborate and understand the nature, opportunities and constraints of the defined scope and scenarios. So, you know, getting it all out there, understanding what are our goals, you know, getting people to percolate ideas, um, you know, making sure we're getting various perspectives from all over that organization. Allow open and honest critique. Um, a great design studio workshop is when it gets a little heated, when there's people that don't agree. Um, I know that can feel a little awkward at times, but that, that means these people are listening, that they care, that they're engaged. So get that out first so it doesn't come out on your design or UX later. You know, let them get on the same page before you even, you know, start sketching anything into a true wire design. And then it helps solidify ideas and services unknown requirements. Um, when someone says, I, I want a video, you know, feature on my homepage, but then no one draws it when they're sketching what they think this should look like, you have to ask why. You know, is that something that we don't really think is valuable or it's lower on the page? So it really kind of helps you get into their heads, but they can't vocalized to you yet because they're still thinking through it as well. Also, a great reason why you want to do something like this is in the historical aspect of what happens uh, with the design group is they'll get the problem, they'll go and solve it in a big black box and they come out and ta-da, it's magic, it's done. Well, then you have the people that you're delivering it to feel like they weren't part of it. They don't feel like it's their solution. You know, it's easier to shoot down something that you weren't a part of that you didn't get to give feedback on in a much earlier stage. All right, so kind of an overview of how these days work. So typically it's a half day session for four hours. If you have a much larger scope that you have, you could elongate it for a couple of days. So I've done both and they both work pretty well. Um, the team can be made up of about five to 25 participants. I say that because once it gets over 25, it gets really hairy. So if we can really identify who are those key stakeholders, and then who are the right people to communicate that direction to? That's really valuable up front. And so we focus on rapid idea generation. So collaboration, iteration, nothing here is polished. Everything is messy. We encourage more, more you know, quantity over quality at this stage. We don't want to block ideas from flowing at this first element. And the goal is really to solidify and articulate those requirements that have not fully been detailed out. And then you end with several good design concepts that then the UX team will take and then do their magic with next. It doesn't mean that what comes out of this room is gonna be exactly what they just designed, right? But it gives them a really good idea of what people are thinking, what's important to these people, and then what to validate and test next. So who should be part of it? Um, here's a kind of a big list. I won't read through all of these, but you know, it's, it's really important to have every key aspect of who's involved with that product or project or site. Um, the one I really want to point out is getting developers in the room is huge. I've been a part of a lot of experiences where the developer gets shown, ta-da, the finished answer, and they didn't get a chance to really give any feedback, and then you realize that the system that you're building in can't support that, which really you know, ruins the whole concept. So making sure you get your developers involved from day one at these sketching sessions, hearing what they have to say so we can hear about the enhancements they can offer and the limitations we should also consider up front. All right, so what you need, this is really old school. So um, you need some walls. Uh, you absolutely need some walls you can either write on or some of that large post-it paper you can stick up on the walls, post-it notes, a checklist of your timing and where you're going, and then Sharpies. 
That's it. That's all you need to get this done. All right, this is a sample uh, schedule outline that I've used in the past. And so how it will work is depending on what you're building. So in this example, we're building a website. And so we've got a main homepage or dashboard. And then we've got a couple other key main sections of the site that we're going to focus on. And so we'll kind of break down what these pieces are. But really, these pieces are repetitive to each piece because it's a you know, quick round of sketching, feedback, and reiterating. And you're going to start with the illumination phase, which is just making sure we get everything that's been done, our requirements on a paper, and who our personas are, so we can keep referencing that as we continue the sketch. So the illumination phase, you know, what are you going to talk about here? It's going to be about business context, uh, features, challenges to consider, any current user feedback we have about what they like, what they don't like. Um, take a look at what your competitors are doing. It's free research. Why not? Check out what's out there, right? And then who are our users? Again, you know, we've, we've started these before having completely defined personas. We've started these with absolutely none of them to start with. So either way, you can make this work and start by just putting some high-level ideas on the board. So here's an example of something I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is called empathy mapping. And this was an experience where this team had not really thought through who their users were yet. So we started by uh, doing a couple interviews with some current users. We looked at some initial research, some features they mentioned. And then we got on the board and really thought through all these key aspects. And here's a little, little bit closer. It's they're thinking, who is your user? And they go on the middle because they're center of everything. And then you think about who, you know, what are they thinking? What are they seeing doing? What are they feeling? And what are they saying? And so this can be very rapid. It can take like five minutes, have everybody, you know, have post-its and a marker, and they start writing up things that they've heard or assumptions, right? And what's great about this is what happens with it is you can transcribe it and start grouping themes. So even though we've got these four quadrants here, what's really important is it's thinking of a different way of how we can get into, in this experience, Ed, the executive's head. What's he thinking? What's he saying? But at the end, we're going to look for key themes that are going to turn into features. OK, a lot of people said that they're not getting daily updates, and that's something that they really wanted. OK, great. So now we know this needs to turn into a feature. And we've got really like-minded <coughs> maps joining from here as well. All right, so with that in mind, we've got our users on the board to reference. We get into our sketching aspects. Um, I love this part, especially because a lot of your product owners or people you're sitting with are actually really uncomfortable drawing. And I kind of love it because it just gets them out of their box. And you tell them, like, hey, it doesn't matter what it looks like. If you can make these marks, you can be a part of this design workshop. So you tell them if they can squiggle, if they can run in a word, if they can make a shape, they're absolutely qualified to get into this. What I find is typically that first sketching round they do, they're kind of nervous, everything's a little smaller than it probably should be. But as you advance on those continuous rounds, they get better at it, they get more confident, things get bigger. So it definitely evolves. And so these are just some like quick sketch examples of some of the things that can come out of these. Again, they don't have to be beautiful, just kind of noting where things are, what things do. Um, very simple, and you know, I try to show these at the beginning too, just to show them, like, hey, the bar is low. No one needs to come out of here with the Mona Lisa or even the car. It's okay. This is all about putting concepts on the board. So that first round is about idea generation, and so what we do first, which is really important, is we get into groups. So uh, let's say it was like a, a ten group or ten people group. You do like two groups of five, so you split it evenly. I try to keep the groups uh, four or five, not over five if you can, just to get them in a smaller grouping. And they're going to go through this together. So they're going to generate an idea individually. So they're going to draw their own. You try to tell them, like, hey, let's try to draw six to eight. What's really going to happen on the first round is they're going to draw two to three. It's OK. Just kind of getting them used to it, right? So this is quick rough. And then within their smaller groups, they're going to critique. So they're going to take three minutes to go around to present their idea. And then the team is going to give them feedback on their idea. From there, they're going to repeat this. Because now that they've gotten feedback from their small teams, they can update it. Now they've seen other ideas. I highly encourage uh, stealing at this point. If someone draws something that you didn't think of, and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't think of that, feel free to steal it. It's totally OK. So they do this twice. And again, it kind of flows into this uh, pattern. It's sketch, present, critique, sketch, present, critique. And so now we've got five ideas within each group that are really starting to form and come together. So now this part gets a little tricky, but after we've done that individual sketching round, we now ask them to create something as a group. 
So these five people in each group, for example, are going to nominate one drawer, and they're going to take key pieces that they like from each one of these. And it's this really just the same you know, type of structure where they're going to go through that piece and repeat. Um, one thing to note is if you have different user groups, you want a group representing each one of those. Who's thinking as the admin person in this role? Who's thinking as the patient in this role? You know, whatever your experience might be. And so what's interesting about this is that it really gets them thinking and sometimes arguing and sometimes being excited together. That's all good because really what's coming out here are problems you would have had 10 weeks down the line if these if this group of stakeholders didn't get it out now. So let them get it out now. Sometimes I just take a step back as that UX person and say, hey, this is, you know, this is a business decision. It's work, what direction I want to go in. And then our team will come in and help them validate that. All right, so this is kind of just some examples of folks in the room so that they've drawn, they're going up, they're critiquing together, they're getting feedback. Um, and this is, again, a very quick process, three minutes, five minutes, three minutes, repeat. And so some of you might be thinking that this sounds like design by committee. It's not because what you really end up with is one sketch per group. So I think the biggest I've seen is uh, five groups. And so you have five sketches to start with. And honestly, this is a great place to start. Now you have five ideas. You've heard their reasoning. They're noting things they like best. Now your UX team can take that, translate into design. Maybe you know they walk out being feeling really firm about two. Those are the two that you test with. So it really is a great place to start and know that now this is what's going to get translated into your wireframes. You know, and then your next steps are always be the visual design and uh, being able to test that perhaps in a prototype session. Now, what I think is important here is I try to keep the visual design out of this part. That's really the next piece. The reason why I say that is if you show something that's fully visually designed, they're going to get stuck on that button color. They're going to get stuck on that darn baby image that they all hate, right? They're going to forget about the flow. They're going to forget about the structure. So make sure you really help by focusing them in by making this very black and white. No logos, you know, no, no real structure. It's all about the flow, the pieces, the locations. Once they feel good about that, then they're ready to see that visually designed aspect and comment on that piece without it changing how you are really creating the structure of the site. And at this point, this is definitely enough for a developer to take back or people to write your user stories off of while you go ahead and solve that visual design aspect. And then the biggest thing about this, and this is the cheesiest picture I could find, which is very on purpose, is that you end with not saying like, hey, we solved something for you. No, I solved something for you as a UX team. No, it's we did it. All of a sudden, these ideas are all of their ideas. They're more engaged. They care more about the outcomes. I find that when you go through this process, your stakeholders ask about how it's doing, how it's performing, because now it's theirs. Now it's theirs, and you've created that, even though you guys you know, really were the ones that took that last step and finished it, but it was with all of their input. So one great place to look at another good example of how design studio sessions work is this is a Vimeo talk. Um, it was done at Agile UX by Todd Warfel. It's about 27 minutes long, and it's totally worth the watch. One thing I will note is this is the way that I conduct design studio workshops, but you guys can form it to whatever makes sense for you. I think what's really nice about this process, again, is it really gets you farther down the line faster. We can figure out what you know, features really don't make sense or what people don't agree with up front before we even create a wireframe. So it saves a lot of time in the, in the long run. And then the other note is this is something I'm really passionate about. So if you guys are interested in how to interject this in your own space or have questions for me, this is my email address, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, the other thing I would note is I am in town for a couple weeks. So if you want to grab lunch and talk about design studio workshops and nerd out with me, please contact me. I'd love to meet with you. And that's all I have for you today. Questions really. Absolutely. I'm going to start off first of all. Um, this is quite an iterative process, and of course, with most iterations, there's learnings and fails. Can you talk about some early fails and how the process has changed and adapted so it is more successful? So that if people are starting this for the first time, they're going to take some of these failures on. Yeah. So, what can they avoid? Great question. Um, actually, one of the experiences that we just did. Uh, in the room that we've been doing something very similar to this in our, our recent project is uh, making sure your facilitator 
And the people that are part of the project are separate people. What's nice about that is sometimes the facilitator has to be really hardcore on like, okay guys, we gotta get moving, we've got 10 minutes left. And if you're the timekeeper that's like cracking the whip, you know, they may not like you as much when you get to the part of delivering. So that's definitely one of them. And the other one is to watch for your quiet people. Um, I think being able to write your ideas down, get them on paper, definitely helps people that are naturally more quiet. Um, but a way to get uh, feedback from people that are more quiet is when you read through things, ask them to be the drawer or ask them to read through their, their feedback. You kind of have to roost that out because you would hate to really leave something on the, on the table, like a developer that's quiet, for example, because they were too nervous to speak up. So really watch the quiet people and find a way to kind of interject them in the experience. Yeah, very good. And that's really important is we experience that today ourselves. Mm -hmm. Any other questions at all about this? Yes. Um, what would be the best way to prepare people for the changes that the UX team might make after the session? So they're probably expecting just a prettier version of what they did. Um, so how would you prepare them for the changes that you're going to make? Great question. Um, so usually what we do, we'll definitely talk about next steps. And the first thing is definitely like establishing that timeline. Like some people are like, okay, so we're going to see this prototype tomorrow. And you're like, oh no, <laughs> there's definitely a phased approach. So you let them know that you're going to take all of these ideas into consideration. You're going to really think through how this is going to come to life. And it may uh, percolate itself into a couple different versions. So I let them know, Fred, okay, these are all concepts. We, were, we are now going to consider into that next phase. And the next time you're going to see them, they're going to be more defined wireframes that we'll give feedback on as a team. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when you come out of the workshop with a couple of concepts that have been approved, or, or approved sort of, yeah. by, by the workshop, do you, do you feel under pressure to work on one that you don't like? That's a great question. I try to think about the why. Um, why is this idea so um, sticking to them so well. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I try to take my opinion out of it as much as possible. So for example, if there's one, if there's two that they're really solid about, I would probably build out two prototypes and test both of them. Because really the the answer of which one should win should always be from your users. These are all assumptions until they've gone through some kind of usability testing. Whether that's guerrilla testing with another department in your group that can go through it if your budget is low, or if it's actually meeting with real users. Obviously, real users are always best, but sometimes you've got timelines that don't accommodate that. So I would say make them both and then validate with the user testing, because otherwise it's going to feel too much like your opinion, and that might get shut down. Well, that, that, that sounds more sensible than, than what I read about advertising agencies years ago, that they might present the concept that they, they love and the concept that the client suggested. Uh, but they, they, make, they, they don't put much effort into the client's mm -hmm. concept and they don't put much effort into presenting the yeah, client's concept. I, I can definitely understand that and I've definitely been places where that's kind of been the plan of thinking just when you know time gets you know crunched but I think the reality is and you're also trying to build up a, a relationship with this team and if they feel like hey they we spent like four hours together and they didn't even take into account something that was super important to me they're not going to come back to you, right? Like you're building up that trust saying, like, you hear me? Okay, let's explore these. Mm -hmm. And then who can argue with what the users say, right? Yeah, exactly. At least if everyone's listening. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and you. I did a UX workshop. I worked in an ad agency for seven years, and uh, it was great. And it was really good to have them brought in from the beginning, like mm -hmm. you were saying. Um, one of the things is how soon should the client expect to see results from the site that's launched? That's Ultimately, what? Oh, very, very good question. So that's going to definitely depend on the scope, the sprints, when the first piece is going to go out. So when it comes to results from the live site, that, that can be a little bit down the road, right? It's all about your development aspect. But results from the usability test, that can be pretty quick. It depends on what kind of fidelity you want to take your prototype in. I've seen people successfully test, you know, very black and white wireframe prototypes that have simple clickability and get really great feedback. Some people will take it to a high visual design, uh, depending on the big scope of your prototype. It could be something in, in two weeks time you get that tested. So the initial feedback would be a good indicator. Yes, I think that usability test, yeah. and then I don't know if everyone's familiar with the SUS, the system usability scale. So that's a standard uh, measurement that shows how usable something is. And so what you can do is you can run through your usability test, your, your usability test, which is main key tasks that they'll do um, on the typical basis. So for example, if you're building an admin tool, 
you want to figure out what are those 10 key tasks, right? And then you're going to ask them to go through each one of those tasks and see how well they can do. At the very end, there's a SUS survey, which you can look that up online and find templates for that. Um, and they'll, they'll score it by saying, like, how easy was it to use? You know, did I know where I was going? So really high level questions that calculates to a score. And you can see, is that average? Is that above average? And then you can share that with your stakeholders. What I really like about the SUS is you can show how it changes over time and by sprint. You can show like, hey, this one feature raised your score by five or it, you know, it diminished it by four. We really have to take a look at this. I think that's the biggest thing that I see too is where you know, something is completely done, but then all of a sudden they add a whole other section and then that diminishes the score of a whole other piece. And so really being able to track it by sprint if possible, is really helpful. Thank you. Metrics. <laughs> it's a team today. Oh. Yes, any other questions? How do you warm people up at the start? Ooh, great question. There's tons of different ways. Uh, why don't you talk about what we did today? Oh, we had an interesting yeah. one. So in, in Optum, we, you know, we value an of our culture. We've got uh, five key values. And it's, it's really something that we live every day. We say it's not something that's on the wall. So we've got a, an ambassador. Um, so she came in this morning and they gave us a 10 minute bit of culture training and it's, it's exercise. And it was a wonderful exercise today. It was a visual exercise about perceptions and what filters people are bringing in. And it was just a nice way of waking everyone up. It was the morning, people are groggy. And it left people to question their own filters and stereotypes. And it's a simple little game. It was, we've got everyone to look out the window. Five seconds, come back, what did you see? And everyone saw something different. And we were able to question that. OK, there's like 20 people here. Why did we see 20 different things? We all had the same view. But we all came back with different opinions. So it was a nice way to ground that in and to value people and to realize, okay, we're all coming together, we're all seeing the same product, but we all have different opinions on this. We got to understand that. A very quick exercise, got people looking at the window and moving around the place and then setting that tone for the day. And that was a small exercise we did today. Yeah. Uh, there's another one we've done before, which is a little handshake, where you go around the appreciation handshake and you thank everyone for being there. And it's quite awkward to do because you don't really know these people at this point in time. So you're saying, oh, thank you for turning up. But it's a nice way to connect, see their name badge, introduce yourself, and just get some energy in the room. So and that's a, a five minute sort of tap out appreciation yeah. handshake you can do. And the perspective on was really good today because it just yeah. made us aware that you know we can all see something different, but we're not wrong. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing, and there's so many different tactics that you can do on this, is like make it a little awkward, make it a little weird, because everyone feels like, oh, that was kind of weird. Like, hey, now we all feel weird together. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It helps. It's yeah. very nerdy, but it absolutely helps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, thank you so much. Um, and again, reach out. Abby's here for another few weeks, um, visiting all the way from Minnesota, um, where the weather here, I believe, is warmer. Oh, way warmer. No sermon at home. So. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Um, okay. Well, uh, we guys go set up. I'll do a quick introduction. Um, so now we're going to take this to almost after you've done your design workshop, and you want to start producing some wireframes and prototypes. And there's various tools out there in the market. And the next talk is going to talk about a brand new tool. It's it's going to be um, effectively demoed and launched um, this evening. I know they've been using it a little bit before. Oh yes, this is as well. So um, this is Tom and Dario, and again, this is a nice international um, presentation this evening. And they're going to present a new product that they've been working on. It's called Views D X, and as I hinted at earlier on, it's going to be a Demonstration about a new language, a new developer language that's for designers. So it allows designers to code using the key value pair type syntax. It's, it's pretty straightforward, and they've been using it um, at Angular at some hackathons recently. So I'm going to hand it over and give yeah. a wonderful presentation on this. Yeah, yeah so. Hi guys, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Dario, and I'm a software architect, and this uh, is Tom. It's good to be here with you. Thanks, Abby, for a, for a great great talk. Uh, we can relate to many points there, like including developers or um, doing workshops with people together, like like contributing to the same product. 
So this is cool. Uh, we're going to make you weird as well, uh, just uh, like off the bat. Uh, we wanted to ask you who you are and sort of like meet you a little bit better and what, on what level you are in terms of development. Because what we did here is, is something in between design and development. So development skills will help you, but if you have design skills, um, that's that's where you will probably most benefit from what we're going to show you today. So uh, raise your hands up. Who's a UI designer? I'm one. Okay. okay. UI designers. Do we have any UI designers? Okay. Cool. Good stuff. Uh, front end developers. Okay. Good stuff. And then like full stack developers, like hardcore. People, okay, one person, good stuff, don't judge us. Uh, so, um, did I miss anyone? Like business folks, business analysts, okay, cool. Marketing. Marketing, yeah, okay. What, what, what do you do? What do you do? No, sorry, the okay. lady behind you. Your product designer. Graphic design. Graphic design, okay. And then someone. Me too. In you too, okay. And then someone. Marketing. Oh, sorry, yeah. Marketing. Marketing as well, okay. Sounds good. So, I'm a full stack designer. <laughs> You're full stack designer. Don't judge us as well. So, what, um, what we wanted to, to, to show you is a workflow, like improved workflow, design workflow, without something that you probably all do. And I do that as well in my old like, day jobs. Um, this is not a day job, by the way. Uh, we did that, by the way, so just, just to give you a little bit of history on it. We did it for us. We developed it for ourselves. So this is not a, like a big enterprise tool that you know it's deployed out there and you can subscribe to it and so on. You can use it and you can try it, and we'll show you how to do it. Uh, but first of all, we wanted to take like get your feedback after that. So we're going to open very quickly to questions and your doubts and be challenging as much as you want. And so, yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask you more questions about sort of like your development skills. Anyone using CSS? We had some, some yes, okay, CSS. CSS and HTML. Okay, that kind of goes together. Uh, CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. Okay, all right. CSS, HTML, JavaScript, Swift, or Objective-C? Okay, so. So it's, it's good that, that uh, you have big understanding of CSS because like many hands was, was raised. The reason why is it good is because our views language is based on, well, I mean, one of those elements, of course, those, those core elements is CSS properties. So with those CSS properties, we're giving you full control over the layout. And the, the, the biggest benefit that you will see is the fact that the handle that you do as designers today is not required anymore. Okay, so you could you could well you could you could be well off starting um, prototyping from this uh, from views from this tool, and then developers could join you very quickly, as Abby said, like right off right off um, the start they could be in, involved in it. And then as they are involved in, um, in telling you or, or helping you out with this, with, with problems you might find, you will start collaborating together and create a one team, which is something that is not happening today as well. Because with the handoff, what we do, we just sort of like say, ta -da, this is the thing, right? And then you just do it. How much would it take it to do it? Okay. Which is probably one of the points that uh, we wanted to touch on first, uh, which is that step of the handoff right now. Don't jump right at it, right? And like, I mean, you tell me guys, like, I'm a developer, so I will get a lot of designs every now and then, like, hey, go implement this thing, right? Does that happen to you? Do you go and talk to developers and say, hey, we did this thing, you know, the, the wireframes that Abby was showing, you know, and all that, and then like, you go to developers and say, do it. Does that happen to anyone, like, or do you contribute to the process as well? And the, what you produce on, a tool and that ends up on the application itself. Is anybody having that at all today? Yeah, yeah? no. Uh, no, not a handover. Is anybody having a process in which whatever you produce on your current tools ends up on the final application untouched? 
doesn't have to be translated by a developer. No. no. Right. Yeah, I guess I guess the point is like, do we have so what we did, we because we developed it for ourselves. Um, so why why should you listen to us, right? In the first place. I mean, what, what, what does it bring to the table that is not on the table already, right? What, right now, what do we have? We have like sketch tools with like a bunch of plugins from Craft and Envision and all the cool things, like you can export it to HTML and so on. You could use uh, Adobe tools, right? Like uh, the <coughs> Muse or what is the other one? They have the one that you can code to so like responsive websites there. You could use Framer or Flo like Reflow, Reflow, right? Uh, anybody using Framer here? Oh, yeah, one. To, to, yeah. yeah, so you know you can do all those things and they like, mock animations and, and all that. And we're going to mock Framer today a little bit because Framer just introduced handoff. Yeah, yeah, we, we're just going to do it without the handoff. So. Uh, so we have three slides there. Uh, not, 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 not that many. Not a lot. <laughs> um, but no, that was, I'm sorry, that was it. <laughs> that was pretty fast. Um, so we just wanted to show you later on what it's like. <laughs> What is it? Um, what are we working on? And so, um, yeah. So we're just going to show you the. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're just going to show you the syntax. Okay. okay. So, so this is views, right? This is views the X the environment, right? Um, what we have here, this is the language that Patrick was talking about before. Um, if you like take those or look at it, I know there are like a lot of things on this one. We, you know, this is actually representing all this thing here. Uh, but if you actually take a closer look, you will see things like background color, height, width, things that we actually see in CSS, right? And the values next to it are hex colors, you know, or like things like some flex stuff, like a line item center, which tend to be pretty cryptic, but we'll get down to that in some other, some other story. And then we have a concept of blocks, as we call them. So most times, like, uh, whenever we, we design stuff, right, and, and work on concepts. It's actually an interesting thing, and I don't know if you can get a chance to see with developers and work on things, uh, kind of like side by side. But what happens is that um, we tend to have similar methodologies when doing things. For, mo for most of it, we all tend to draw some boxes and kind of go like, okay, I'm gonna put this thing here, that thing there, right? And now that might be something more abstract, like a service design or like some sort of backend API or whatever, or it may also be a UI, right? So all of those sort of concepts are always like kind of coming together. And for that, we define probably like what is like two core concepts, I guess, yeah. like the layout mechanism in a way you could say. And that's what allows you to kind of create anything you want in a way. And those are horizontals that allow you to put things one next to each other, like we have an icon some text. And then verticals allow you to put them one below the other. With that, you can pretty much. So it's it, yeah. So we just jumped. We just jumped right in to the to the to, to how it works. But in a sense, it's we have like a basic blocks. We have three main sort of concepts, basic blocks that you would be building your your um, UI from. And we have something that we call proximity nesting, which are those gaps in between, since we need to nest things inside of each other, like you would do it in Sketch, for example. How many of you are using Sketch? By the way, just because I got to okay, refer to it a little bit. So it's like in Sketch, you would be using folders, right, to nest things. Uh, we didn't want it to like have another like place where you go to and you need to reorder your your stack. So we came up with something new, which which essentially is like the more spaces you put, the the further the the, the 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 folder you're reaching, the level you're reaching. Right? So for instance, if this bit of text would be like a few lines, like you would actually be inside the thing of stuff, and you wouldn't be like sort of far away from it. Yeah. So no. Our layout will break a little bit, right? Because we we now we place the text and everything below in the horizontal that is above. You see the, the, the horizontal here, right? So now it says this. <coughs> no, sorry, no. I, I put it into the, the vertical. Into the vertical so that is. There's one of, one of the concepts that is here is that um, as you go timing things, you can see that now vertical change to horizontal. So you have all those hints that tell you where things are in a way. And you can see, like, okay, so this thing is inside this or that. And then something went absolutely, like, you know, off, and we just don't see anything anymore. And this is a concept that when they like, develop things, one of the things that we found is that this study can be very daunting. I don't know, have you, have any of you actually tried to, like, develop other stuff? Like, say, I know some people are working with JavaScript and so on. Did you try to venture more into that set of things? Anyway, yeah, no? Okay. So, I mean, one of the things that you probably found, I don't know, I haven't used, for instance, um, how was the syntax? 
how was the environment that you were using, right? Uh, did you get a lot of errors? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's one of the things that happens a lot, right? Like you, you first of need to get out there and like look for those things, and sometimes it's, a lot of that is out of reach. You know, like uh, environments don't tend to be permissive. If something fails, it fails. It's all wrong. It turns some dirt, some whatever. And, and those are one of the concepts that, that we said, right, we can kind of fix that. So we tried to get with Tom working on, like, say, we said, okay, well, here's React, right? Well, what about if you write some React? And it seems easy enough. But here's the deal like, designers need to actually look at so many other things that if we actually overload that with learn code, then it's just not practical, right? Plus, on the other side, like, it's not that every designer out there wants to be a developer. In the same way that we don't want to be designers, you know, we complement, and that's the whole thing, right? So, why did we make a, a language? So well, here, here you probably see the the, the, the lack of uh, what you would typically see in code, yeah, right? Well, many things. of you code, yeah, no colors, so you, no you know, colors, no... yeah, you, you you know you know CSS, uh, many of you know HTML. You see, you know, you see none of that, none of this this sort of like columns, semicolons, nesting, and, and all those like grouping and stuff. None of, none of the divs. And it all works, and it all compiles to React code. And then we morph it to native. And we tell you about that as well. So it's like, it's a, this is not what you would use in the browser. This is not what you would sort of like put in the browser and it would just work. You would compile it to React, React Native. You can, you can morph it to anything else. We call it morphing, but it's like kind of like Translating it, it's kind of magic, but yeah, yeah, it's like a bunch, like a bunch of algorithms that just like take the bits of code and. Um, mm. And one, one interesting thing that, that we like made sure that that you know kind of sync that. You won't let me talk about development that much, though. <laughs> <laughs> when we when we were talking about the marketing process, one of the things that matters a lot is that um, you know it's, it's okay. Well, how much black magic is behind this to actually for that to run? Because developers would highly like to tell you, like, I'm, I'm not gonna take that. So we're waiting for that for that question for the for the, for the full stack developer from the back. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So you know, and, and that's the thing, right? It, um, it shouldn't have all that magic. Like it should be as close as to what a real like person coding would actually do. If any of us would actually code it, it should be the closest to us, right? And and that's like one of the things that we put a lot of focus on and effort into making sure that what it produces is um, you know as lean as it can be. Um, and there's no extra framework whenever you're running this. You don't get like an overhead or something else that would run on top of it and would make your, your application sluggish and all that kind of stuff. What else should we say? Okay, so oh yeah, so we had this thing. We had this thing that that we wanted to um, to sort of like show you or like ask you maybe uh, if you would get to like do this layout, looking at this syntax for five minutes that you that you were. Would you know how to make that layout with those simple elements? Right? Would you like intuitively could say, oh yeah, I know how it works. I, I know how to do it. Uh, Daria mentioned something about horizontal best way. I know how to do it. Would you know that? How many people would know that? Not many, right? <laughs> that's 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 a good thing, right? Because uh, so we we were working on this on this thing for for this for this event specifically. Uh, we didn't finish it, so. Sorry for that. We wanted to like launch it and like say, oh yeah, go download it and play with it and so on. So we were like, if you're gonna, guys, we're gonna have some addresses there. If you're gonna join Slack or like follow us on Twitter, we're gonna ping you when it's when it's ready. Um, and and we, we call it blocking for some reason. It has nothing to do with agile, uh, like being nasty and agile or like um, blocking in American football. Uh, but you can probably relate to that. So but that has nothing to do with it, but um, but in, in fact, it's more like wireframing, right? So so it's a simple it's a simple way to get this this structure that you see of blocks of those you know those those orange things. These are these are these are blocks into your into your your editor, and then have that that wireframe being displayed. So then with, the only thing you have to do is to say add text or replace the SVG with the with the icon that you actually want, right? And we call it blocking. Maybe you're gonna like it. Um, let's do some let's start some test. Okay. It starts with, with the white screen. Probably like we don't know what to do. We uh, there will be another button here, don't worry. Uh, I press command B and we get into the blocking mode. And now within the blocking mode, 
we can start drawing rectangles that as we're drawing them, you see that the, the, the view, the code updates. And then I can add more things into it. So say there will be a view that will have a vertical, meaning items distributed vertically. And then within those, say like a, like a typical iOS tab, right? With few tabs next to each other. I would do then, um, I would change to, to draw each tab. Each tab will, be, will have an icon and a text below. So that has to be vertical, right? It will distribute, the vertical distributes things one below the other. And so I'm gonna add them as many as I want, say I want three. And then I will put the, say an image as, as an icon. So I'm gonna add three icons to it. And as you see, the code is being generated as I do it, right? So, so there you go. Now the only thing you need to do is to get out of blocking, which I show you in a second. But you see the code right right now. You can also like edit those things. Meaning, if I don't want something, I can like remove it, right? Um, and as you get out of as you get out of blocking, you're getting a Full representation of your of your elements as a wireframe, and as I said, the only thing you need to do is to come in and add text or add images, replace those those elements, and you can build the iOS tab, for example. Right, the iOS tab, iOS tab that you can define, say, what size of icons do you want? Um, do you even want the text label like? The, Obviously, like if we want to follow Facebook, we don't want text labels anymore, right? So, like you can decide those things. You can decide. You can create those those mm, those interfaces or those elements of the interfaces. <laughs> but then developers can come in and say, "Okay, so how? What? What about the interaction? How do you want it? So, if, if we click it, what what happens, right? What what should we do? You can then collaborate with developers because the tool is collaborative. We don't have an, another app. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that so you can, if you try it, experience, so we could all be there actually. And, yeah. yeah. If you if you, if you try it on your own, if you want to if you want to give it a go, um, you can set up the account. It's free, and just go in with few people or within your team. Try it with your, within your team and see what they think, and um, and join one view, and then you can all post together in one view. It's that's that's already there. Uh, an interesting aspect as well of. Um, this sort of like a blocking aspect is that this is actually converted to like real things as well. So it also ends up in a real application. So you could say, okay, well, but I have an idea. I want to test a flow, for instance. And you're not like super committed <coughs> about what are the icons that you're going to have or all that kind of stuff, right? Because it doesn't really matter. So then you can definitely attach, say, actions to these things to say, okay, on peak of that, jump to something else. And then you're actually testing the interactions and the flows, and you know it doesn't really matter that much. You need to unlock it. Yes, your phone. Yeah, sounds cool. Okay, so sure. So we wanted to show you as well. I mean, we were just sort of like playing around with it, but um, so it's not it's not it's not available out there yet, like on the App Store. It will be soon. So just let us know if you want to know more about this. But you can be like in. You know, you can be somewhere like sitting on the on a bench in a park, which is something that we like to do. And I mean, I, I like to do that, for example. And you can be working. The idea is that, um, like with this tool, which is like um, it's like a like a blocking uh, app in a way, uh, you could potentially like do that from whatever really doesn't matter. And um, and then those that actually syncs back and produces the same code that you're seeing here. So matter of fact, it's the same um, view that is running on both. Combined from the same same code that was created and used. Yeah, maybe that's. I mean, that's. I don't know if that's a, like an interesting fact for you guys, but whatever you see here built here in the that app, that mobile app, yeah. this this full environment, all of that is built in views. So a little bit of inception here, but that's that's. It's not like, you know, it's not a, a joke. It's not I mean, that I mean, we needed something else, and then we're like, all right, we're now. I, I wish we would have more jobs. Yeah, 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 yeah. That much. Uh, but either way, I mean, so the the thing that we wanted to do here is also to show you this guy. Uh, but before we do that, we want to show you this. So 
what we're working on right now, which might be interesting or exciting to you, might, might sound exciting to you, is input from Sketch, which is something that everyone wants. Um, and so we just did it as well. So, so input from Sketch. Rough, like, uh, it kind of works, <laughs> but it needs a few more things so that you know, the workflow when you're actually involved in the page is a bit. It's great. This guy is like always like, it needs something else. <laughs> it's great. It's actually, I mean, when I saw it as a designer, the fact that I can take a sketch fully fledged, and there's a, in, over there, when you go to Learn Views, do we have it? Learn yeah, yeah. Uh, in Learn Views DX, if you go there to, to, the, to our medium publication, there's a post there that shows you exactly how we did it with all the like screenshots and stuff. And, it's, and it works. I was just amazed that I can design with high fidelity, like pixel perfect layouts. And then I, I can just put it in, and it will produce a UI, which was to me was amazing because none of the other tools, even even though some claim, some plugins claim that you can export to HTML or something like that, none of those actually create functional layouts. None of those. None, none of those create an, an application, a clean code that then developers can take and say, oh, I'm happy with this. I'm going to take it and use it as it is. None of those. So, so that's that's why we yeah, have to develop this app, really. Anyway. <clears throat> but it's good. So, the thing that we're missing right now and we're working on uh, currently are animations. The reason why we didn't release it yet is because we want them to work on web and on native together. So, when you're doing animations, uh, and maybe we didn't touch on this point yet, but yeah. the reason why we want this to be sort of like cross-platform and and. The reason why you see this last point here as well is because we will take, and we are taking to build this app, this blocking app, for example, we will take advantage of React Native, and we're going to release it across. So when you build your UI and views language, um, you, it works across. Right? So you don't have to be worried, oh, wait a minute, OK, so, so I'm going to build this, but that's going to be for like a web, and I'm going to have to like build another thing for like a mobile, and then maybe another thing for Android or for desktop. Okay, all of that will be covered with with this with React Native, yeah. uh, and that's why we like sort of like um, we researching the the animations framework. There's there's many of them, and uh, as some of like like Framer does it, they they implemented a bunch of them, and now you just have to learn a bunch of them. And um, happy days, right? For Framer, for Framer, not really for us, uh, but that's that's. I mean, that's their, that was their solution. We want to have one maybe constrained a little bit. So maybe you won't be able to do like crazy curves and stuff. But you probably wouldn't do it either way. I mean, you, you, but what we found out at least um, is that you need simple uh, animations like um, we have them here, for example. I can show you. Those are already there. So like a little hover, right? That's, like those things you really need in the in the application, not in the website. We're not talking about like some very cool 3D new and like experiences. We're talking about applications, right? This is what we here. This is what we're building here. So here, you know, like a like a simple scaling CSS scaling effects. You you know CSS, so you know what we're doing there. So that's so that's it. Uh, then flows, okay. Flows is something that that we need to introduce for UX designers. There was many hands up here, so it will be relevant for you guys as well. We want to be able to, which, which we are not right now. Right now, we're building each view in its in its separate container, and then developers take it and they could, we would like connect it via route. We want to be able to say, okay, I want this button to go to link to this view, this button to show the state, and so on, okay. Uh, because you're so technique, technically um, advanced, maybe we should say something about props. Um, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I don't know if any of you have used, like say those um, sketch plugins, for instance, allow you to connect to data and like APIs and that kind of stuff to like field lists and all that. We get some value here. Yeah. So like we um, we know that that's important. Uh, like working with real data kind of matters. Um, well, what we figure here is that uh, like. Um, you kind of have to model it somewhere. So we introduced this concept of um, props, and, and within that, a concept of different states. 
in which, like in this case, there's only one state main. Um, but if you actually go to, I think it's Mrs. Strawberry for higher has that. Yeah, so you can see a bit of a, like a drop down there of props, and you can actually. She's actually available. She's actually available. <laughs> and you can actually see here that we have, we have main and higher, right? So when somebody would actually come here and click higher now, that would actually change to the next state. Uh, so the way we, we kind of see this is in a way as like snapshots in time. So that's all driven by data that's coming from the outside. And that data generally comes from the databases or applications that we're driving it from. And, and, and this concept of props is like that external sort of uh, motor that, that eventually ends on your application and allows you to display different things. And I guess you can think of states as the, 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 the simplest way for me to think of states is like a different app port in your sketch file. So you would have like, you know, you would have what happens, there's a button, nothing happens to a button, and then I have another output with the button clicked or button hover over or, you know, I clicked something and the pop-up happens. So I have like one output that doesn't have a pop-up and another one that does have a pop-up. So essentially that's what it is. One says pop-up is true, another one says pop-up is false. That, I mean, that's how complex it gets. Um, we will be simplifying still, right? Because we yeah. found that there, there are little things, but just to show you how it, how it works, so for, like the simplest one, height and width, you see here that we are specifying height and width in props tab. And then when you go to, to the, the view tab that holds the code with blocks, you get to see here, right? That it ref references the, the prop that is height that lives over there. It will come from an external source, source which, mean, which means that, for example, if the device is different, or if you want to de deploy on a different uh, size of, 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 a, of a window, you can just change that externally. You don't have to come back here and like duplicate the view and then like say, okay, now I want for another type of device like this thing, right? Like, like essentially solving the responsive design thing where you have to have like ten different files, and this one shows like. 360, this one shows 500, the other one shows another way, right? So this, this is what happens here. Um, and obviously those would, those would scale. So like, just to show you that we are not joking again, I mean, this works. So like if there's another width coming in, things will scale. And yeah, make sense? Then I lose you. Then I lose you on prop stuff, right? <laughs> Uh, that's what I did. Yeah, lost as well. <laughs> so okay, so I mean, we will uh, do a workshop tomorrow and Thursday if you want to like get hands on this and like try it and break things. Uh, just, just uh, we, we, we don't have details there, but we have it on Twitter. We don't do it um, And so, so that, so that's one. Uh, what else do we want to? So one of the things that we're also working on is. Yeah. Um, we know that like learning things takes time, right? And that's why we have Ash. Um, Ash is like our AI mentor. Uh, so we are building that at the time. And the idea of it is like, um, so I don't know how many of you like generally go to docs and like like scan pages and pages and go right find that thing that you are like or Google to use, or Google right and all that kind of stuff. And so yeah, so this kind of like Google there in a way, uh, but it's smarter and you. It knows the context of your code. It knows what you are looking at, where your cursor is, and it can provide you with things where like things just went like what's going on here. So yeah, we hopefully help you without that and like you know get you get you going. Um, yeah, that's something we're really excited about actually. So and then the the, the, the most of React Native we talked about it. So I think we just uh, just gonna go to 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 the addresses. You can join our Slack uh, as well. Ask questions there. Uh, but if you have any questions now. We, we are happy to answer that. Yeah, I, well, I actually have two questions. Uh, from You're not the only one, sorry. Okay, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, the, the thing is, I'm a graphic designer. I yeah. know HTML, CSS. That's about it. Okay. Uh, You'll be flying. And then the development part. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what's the learning curve? I mean, um, because first I, I thought, uh, I actually read uh, on Medium. Article out there where you say that uh, what you have done, one of the things you have, you have done is taking HTML and converting it into something that is uh, more intuitive. I mean, taking away all the divs, all the yeah. okay. Uh, and then you talked about uh, importing mm -hmm. just from Sketch. So, from a designer point of view, um, you don't like it. No, no, what does it? 
<laughs> okay, all right, do sorry. To, do I have to just design a okay. I need to convert to something I can use, or I have to learn uh, this language, and how much is it going to take? Yeah, I, I understand your, your question now. So I guess, so I guess the, 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 the reason why we didn't want to constrain you to do one thing is because we just don't like, I mean, I, we, again, we did build it for ourselves, right? So I don't like to be constrained. Okay? And I sometimes, I start with sketch on a paper. Uh, sometimes I start with sketch, like UI. And I might have that UI, so then what do I do, right? It's sort of like counterintuitive to say, yeah, yeah, you have your UI and sketch, that's great, but now you have to rebuild it there, right? So it's like, I wish I could just use it, right? So now, so the, the point is that you can use it at any stage that you are on. So maybe you are on stage, if there, there was few UI uh, designers here. So if you are on the stage of UI design, right now in Sketch, for example, we, we don't have Illustrator, um, like input, Adobe doesn't have APIs and stuff. But, um, but we, but you can you can start you can start right there. You can import stuff into into views and get familiar with what views did, what what your what your design means in views, at least as a as a starting point, right? You can say, okay, I I've put like a button. What what did it do? What does it mean? How do I make a button in views? So that's that's one way of learning or getting into it, right? Another way of learning would be to through blocking that that we showed. So you can. Just sort of like wireframe, simple stuff, and then say, okay, so if I'm gonna put like three things inside of another thing, what sort of code does it give me, right? So that's another way of learning. Uh, if you go to Slack um, and you join our Slack, uh, we are more than happy to help you like with snippets of code and stuff. What we also doing is we building this this sort of like library, but we building everything at once. Um, when I don't look for that, can I ask you so, that it actually gives you, um, which is understanding of uh, the target platform that you're working on. So one of the things that I said before was that you want to bring your developers as soon as you can, so they can tell you what's going to run, what's not going to work. So if you start, like, say, overlaying tons of things, most times developers will say, no, nah, can't do that. Because, like, you know, if you do that kind of stuff, then you end up with a really, like, um, say, mocked UI in a way. Like yeah, and performance and a bunch of other things, right? So by we jump into something that that gets closer to code, right? In that regard, uh, you start understanding the constraints of the platforms. You start understanding how your design actually impacts the final application, and that's something that adds great value to you um, as a designer. Because then you you're closer and you can iterate faster towards making things that will actually work from like say the get go. And there, there was a there was a great guy with us. He's not with us anymore. Uh, who said that design is not how things look like, but how they work, right? And I mean, this is this is what helped me at least. And um, I don't know if, if it's translatable to any any other career, but since I got closer to code, you you guys code as well, so maybe you know maybe it happened to you as well. What happened to me was when I understood how things work. I could design them better. Since I could design them better, I could go to junior de uh, junior designers and say, mm, maybe we should try do something about this. That might not work, right? Let's let's figure out a better way of going about this. And at that point, you from being just being graphic designer who might want to learn how to code, instead of going to Code Academy, which I did, and I don't know how many of you fail at this sort of like early learning, but I did miserably, and it's. It's like instead of going through the pain of like learning all those all those languages, you can still produce <coughs> highly functional production code, production red code, right? And say, I know how it works. I know how to how flex works, how to align things. You know, I know how to um, how to position things within the layout. You know. On that note, uh, the you know the views language is open source. All the morphers are open source, so you know you can. Totally use that any project so that they contribute to it. Yeah. So what I wanted to show you here, guys, is that like that another way of, for you to learn about this. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's it felt like the post wasn't that great that you, that you read uh, on on on, my, on Medium. We we try we'll try to write better posts. 
uh, about it. It's a, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort. You know, we, we try to, look, to write tutorials as well. We will be running mentors, uh, mentor sort of like sessions. So that would be another way for you to maybe get into it if you want. Uh, here, uh, we will have more in, in at this address, proud.views.psdx, we will have like more um, the parts. Right now, we just have icons, but this is like a, like a library of icons that you can just grab and, and then replace your icons with if you, if, you want, if you like those. If you don't, you can just create like your own icon in Illustrator or Sketch, save it as SVG, copy that code, and then as you copy it, you see some magic happening because it won't be any more SVG code, it will be views code. Uh, like, sort of like morph on the fly, so it, it all morphs to to use code, and we're trying to be as helpful as as possible. Uh, but again, like we we really want your feedback, so that's why I guess we're here. You know. The second question. Sorry, we were talking a lot. There. I'm afraid to ask. No, no, no. no basically, uh, what, what was I to ask? No, no, no. no. Okay, I'll try to be gentle. No, the thing is. Um, well, how powerful is really this? What I mean is, from, from my perspective, as a designer, and uh, as you were, you were saying at the beginning, uh, I don't see why a designer should code or a coder should design um, to a higher level. I mean, it's good to understand. Um, so what I mean is, how, power, how powerful is, is this app, or is, or is it going to be? Am I going to be able to get, for example, my sketch files Put them directly there, and is it going to deliver uh, what I have designed, or do I have to go through a learning curve that is going to be something in between programming and design? I guess you would, but 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 my point from before was that it's good for you. So I mean, it's I don't I don't want to be judgmental. I I, I appreciate that there are designers who might be like just artists and they like just like that design things, and it's, it's fine. But especially if you're doing application design, maybe not website that much, but application design, you applications are more about like performance and usability, you know, and like you like clarity, not, not about like, like how good you can be with designing icons, you know? It's more about how clear that icons are, what, what, do, what they stand for. For example, right. So, the more you understand those, how to call them, like the, the, the constraints of, of what you design for, maybe I don't know how to call it, but that's how close I, as I can understand it. You know, is that is that the, the more you understand those constraints, and one of those constraints is are technicalities of what this guy is all about, which is like, sorry, that just won't go. It's just one run, run. That's like that's crazy stuff that you do the game. So, how am I how am I supposed to implement that? You know, so then you then you meet the wall. So meeting that wall of like saying, okay, I want to fly to the side, rotate, and then scale and bang, and at the end I want loads of hearts or cats. We, we like the cats. So you know, it's like it's it, it, how how why why how you know and what for? And when you understand that this is this is crazy stuff. Like this is just like you could do. <clears throat> sorry, you could do it, but it's just like. It's just not necessary. When you understand that, it's 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 you understand that by learning a little bit about how to code. So there is a little bit of learning curve, but we 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 release another uh, blog that will list all those blocks, those those, <clears throat> those basic blocks, right? And and all those basic blocks that there is five, six of them, yeah, something, yeah. something like that, yeah, yeah. you know. You have six things that but you can compose. Yeah, I think that you would use to like text, image, SVG. Yeah, you elements that you can choose. Because you like you know sketch, draw even in parts, uh, vertical or horizontal that we mentioned before, and then all the inputs. There is a list as well. So, so I guess we have just to tell you about it a little bit and answer your question. There, are the le your learning curve is three wrappers that wrap either horizontally and distribute objects horizontally. So if you're going to put stuff inside of horizontal, you can you can expect it, though, these things to be distributed horizontally. Or a vertical, which will do the opposite, will distribute them vertically. Or a list, which takes only one block, could be as complex as it gets. Right? So it could be one vertical that has loads of other stuff inside, like a card, for example. 
that has like an image and then buttons and, and SVGs and things like that, right? And it will automatically repeat it based on the props that it gets from the list. So, <laughs> so like this here's, the, here's the name of the list, and this is your item, 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 right? So then you can see here. So for example, like just just to give you just to give you like a like a specific example of that, you can see a list of users, right? And then you, you see one user, another user, which which are the items, and then you see the name and the the photo as a as a URL. Is that is that hot? Does it feel hot? No, no, it's fine. Because I mean, then there's another bit that might feel a bit hot. As I said, it sometimes feels hot to, to me, which is how do you get from this data representation to how do you put it to the view? How do you connect these two tabs, right? Because you need to connect them at the end. So so then what happens is that you go to users list, which is this block, right? It's, it says users list, and then it says an image that then says source, take source from image from item avatar, which was there, we saw it, right? So you refer to the item, and then you say, and take the name from item name. And it takes them, and it puts them here, right? Yeah. And the bit that is missing is that you take that from props user. So you refer to that list, right? That's as hard as it gets, as complex as it gets. Yeah. And how would a developer, uh, in a risk lab room, how would a developer look at something highlighted and say, what do you mean here? Like, what do you intend to happen in this kind of design? So, yeah, there's that. So, so there are comments as well, right? So you can leave comments in here. And as a matter of fact, we kind of use this as a chats sometimes where we are like, yeah, that. Uh, there's also another thing that we are to use. So you could like, you know, hand over that to someone and say, hey, do these things, right? Um, like they they were displaying somewhere here, they're not pretending. Um, yeah, basically with that you just kind of like can you know ask other team members to see what's going on with and so on. Uh, when you are um, on the live editing, if you like select the part of it, you actually the other person see what's going on and you can like talk over it. Yeah. I so did something very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I broke something. Yeah. Right. I broke my keyboard. With articles. There are to do's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So so yeah. So you can you can comment stuff. Yeah. 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 You have any other questions? I'm kind of curious just to hear more about the internals of the sketch import. It seems like maybe there's like two categories. There's some things that you set explicitly in sketch, like scaling rules uh, that you could interpret and convert to uh, code. And then there's some things that don't seem like they, they're set explicitly in sketch, like in the vertical wrapper, in the folder vertical wrapper or horizontal wrapper. How do you deal with those two different things? So we, for that to work on sketch, yeah, we, so we tried like importing whatever you produce in sketch, like in your own files. Uh, what I found that this my experience, like, you know, like many, many different sketch files, is that they're a little mess. Everything's like all over the place. And the reason for it is because there's no way for you to actually put a proper structure through it other than just dragging it around the screen, you know, what is the way it's possible, right? Um, so what we ended up with is that you actually have to have a folder structure that has to go like, okay, so I, I'm going to put this thing, and that's going to be a vertical, right? And that's going to have all this stuff. And then if I want to have this stuff like that, I'm going to add color or horizontal. And yeah, a bunch of things like that. Yeah. So there's annotations in the in the layer. So your, your folders, yeah. Your then folders need to be named. You name the folders. Uh, the thing. And we are on that as well. Uh, we, we have like that's that's the part that I'm saying that we're working on is more on the experience of actually making that. Uh, so you get a few shortcuts really that you can just go on one and that will just make it for you. So like, for example, like selecting selecting a couple of of, uh, of elements and then going like. Command H, for example, and then that would make horizontal, so we would put them into horizontal folder, folder, right? I mean, you you would still need to know that there is a horizontal and vertical, so maybe that's the learning curve. Like you need to know that, but that's really it, you know. I guess we have a question. Hey, um, so I'm wondering how far the collaboration can continue once once the designer has produced what you have there using views, and um, it essentially gets to the developer more. Um, the developer starts adding business logic code. Can it then can there be an iteration? Like, can it go back uh, through that process of the designer adding more to it? And how how's the code? How, how does the developer work with it being iterative, potentially iterative? Like, 
that design needs to be changed. Um, does the is the code is the code separation there, um, and can ultimately go back to that workflow? I think I, I can probably answer that. So um, props. That's that's the answer. Which is really yeah. So props are kind of contract between from your view to the outside world. So the developer's logic would be outside that. And all you've got, all you're doing here, like you know, you're the users, and they will have avatar name. Do us with this. That's why it really. Yeah. Another thing is that you can also amend the the morph. So whatever you really need to do, because all of that's open source, it's up to you. Like we we don't want to constrain the designers or developers on a, on any sort of side. So you can you can do that. There is a bit more. Like if you, if you want to join and see how if you want to join one of the workshops and see how it's done. Dario can walk you through like steps. There's there's like say routing within React that you need to do a little bit. So there are little steps there that you need to do for the views to be to, to, to be connected. But there's there's also like the the, the amazing thing that you did for Hackathon, uh, which is the oh, yeah. so auto syncing. Yeah, so we have like essentially like when you when you enter the development flow, do you have time but or uh, well, <laughs> We're wrapping. Well, I mean, I'll, give it, I'll give it two minutes. Let it go to yes. Yeah, we have PFA eight. So. Uh, yeah, no, so essentially, like when you when you're working with this on your like development environment, like the other like dark side things, um, essentially what happens there is that you you have a, like an app that runs and it syncs everything you make here. Uh, so you can you can change this on the UI and they instantly sync with your app. And then um, they say, I'm say we we they hosted the hackathon over the last weekend. And uh, one of the things that people really wanted was to get their applications out there as soon as they could. So we also introduced like a, like one command deploy. So you go, you know, deploy and you just gives you your and no people. Kind of that yeah. Yeah. It actually has to be remote that that's the thing. Yeah. So yeah, no, I mean it's it's pretty the way that I, I said it's awesome because it's to me to be able to see my app as I develop it and then as I hit save, it's being out of deployed to an address where I can just click things. I mean, it's 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 a production app. It's not a, it's not a click through. It's not envisioned stuff that we're talking about. It's production code, right? You deploy it and it runs and it's performant. So that's good. okay. Um, there will, of course, you did say there's going to be a workshop, um, so there's going to be some tutorials and training around that. So I think you're going to have information on Twitter. Yes. Use the X. Use the X. Yes, yes, yes. Use the X. Uh, we'll tweet that. We'll put it on, on the Meta page as well with Cheers. all the links for the. the Thanks for having us. Like. Thanks for organizing. No, thank you for coming. Uh, mm -hmm. That's it. So, a big thanks to the Bank of Ireland for hosting us this evening. It was, it's, a, it's a nice venue here. Um, our next scheduled event will be, I think, the 29th. But we will be having a pop-up one halfway through the month, so just keep a little lookout for that. Um, uh, it, it's going to be organized last minute, so we'll get it up there. We're just trying to coordinate that. So until the 29th, thank you for coming along.